Sailors. So Steve Sailor has just written a terrific column that I must share with you. And for the first time in my adult life, I've, I've paid some attention to female basketball and solely because of one person, Caitlin Clark, right? She's heterosexual, right? She's a white girl out of middle America and she's likable, she's attractive and she does cool things with the basketball and she's not a, some thug. And why is the WNBA a completely losing organization uninterested in dialing back the thuggishness that currently dominates the league. So Steve Saylor writes, The Caitlin conundrum when thuggishness damaged the appeal of the National Basketball Association around the turn of the century. So think about all the problems in the National Basketball Association with criminal behavior, with impregnating women that uh, the basketball players aren't uh, married to, right? just the, the overall bad behavior of so many National Basketball League players. Remember how bad it was in the 70s? So I first started paying attention to the National Basketball Association in the 1970s, and it was the least appealing, and it had the least hold of the American public of the three major sports. All right, you'd even have NBA Finals games that would not even be televised live because the league was dominated by thugs who did a lot of drugs and behaved like thugs, and America was not into that. So when the thuggishness damaged the appeal of the National Basketball Association, the executive leadership took steps to rein it in. So why haven't NBA executives intervened in their women's NBA vanity project to protect their most valuable asset, rookie Caitlin Clark, right, from the racist, heterophobic violence at the hands of their black, lesbian-dominated players who have managed for three decades to keep the WNBA unpopular and unprofitable. So how often do you hear about heterophobia? Right? You never hear about heterophobia. Right? But uh, there's just as much proportionally heterophobia here about heterophobia as there is homophobia. Right? Just as th there are plenty of Jews who don't particularly care for non-Jews, at about the same proportion as there are non-Jews who don't particularly care for Jews. But you never hear about anti-Gentilism. Right? That's the hate that dare not speak its name. And you never hear about heterophobia. But it's present, right? If you've got a strong homosexual identity, you're highly likely to have some fear and some negative feelings about heterosexuality and heterosexuals. Just like if you have a strong heterosexual identity, it may absolutely turn your stomach to see in a movie or a TV show, like suddenly two guys start kissing and embracing. I mean, for me, it just turns my stomach. I have a, just a visceral repulsion, not because I think the people engaged in this behavior are bad people, it's just distasteful for me because I have a heterosexual orientation and I have only ever had heterosexual sex. And the idea of sex between men is, is completely repulsive. That's just a function of my heterosexual identity. So too, I would not be surprised if for many homosexuals, the, the idea of heterosexual activity is repulsive, right? The stronger your in-group identity, the, the more likely you are to have negative feelings about out-groups. And just as there are plenty of white people who aren't that thrilled with black people, in fact, have some fear of black people and have some negative feelings about black people, proportionally, there are just as many black people who have those same negative feelings, right, about white people. So group identity doesn't just belong to Christians. It doesn't just belong to white people. All right, group identity is something that all groups have, and the higher your in-group identity, all right, the more likely you are to have resentment and fear and concern and distaste and disgust with out-groups. But it only ever gets described in one way, right? How often have you heard about rookie Caitlin Clark, right, suffering from racist, heterophobic violence at the hands of black, lesbian-dominated players, right? We're supposed to think that... Uh, Sexual phobia only runs in one direction. It's just something that uh, uniquely uh, heterosexual people have. And, and the, good, the good people of the homosexual community just never experience this. But it's nonsense. All right. The, the executives of WNBA and the NBA have considerable power to change their rules and how the referees interpret them to improve their product. Right? Normally boring baseball, slow-moving baseball, for example, sped up its play by 15% in 2023, 
by imposing a pitch clock to cut down on dawdling. Right, the game still has problems, such as excessive velocity on pitches leading to too many injuries and strikeouts. Right, so Dodgers slugging shortstop Mookie Betts on Sunday got his hands broken by a 98-mile-per-hour fastball. So Betts is amazingly quick. Right, so you can't really say that it's his own fault. He didn't get out of the way soon enough. Right, but the success of baseball's pitch clock reform it is going to get people to talk about other possible changes, perhaps reducing pitch velocity. You might want to require starters to work five innings or miss their next start. Or why not call all pitchers hitting 100 miles per hour or faster on the radar an automatic ball? Similarly, during the 1990-1991 basketball season, to keep the two-time defending champion Detroit Pistons all right, from continuing to pound boringly on Chicago Bulls superstar Michael Jordan, the NBA increased the penalty fl- for flagrant fouls. All right, this liberated Michael Jordan to win six titles and launched the NBA to immense global popularity. Would the NBA have been nearly as popular if it was still dominated by thugs? Of course not. And we can do this not just in basketball. All right, we can do this throughout life by penalizing thuggish behavior, sanctioning thuggish behavior, allowing people to have more freedom of association, more freedom to do what they want with their own property so that people who act in a thuggish manner all right, receive a sufficient deterrent that uh, they start changing their ways. All right, Michael Jordan returned in, retired in 1998 and the NBA's brutalism trend worsened in 1999, the NBA's overall free throw shooting percentage, right, a figure that you'd think would go up over time, just as field goal kicking accuracy tends to go up in the NFL, dropped to its lowest point in the 1960s. So the players who are dominating the NBA were impressionable adolescents during the Bloods versus Crips crack war of a decade earlier, and they tended to dress like gang members off the court. Okay, what's going on with Hezbollah? On the strategic level that Israel could not annihilate and eliminate Hamas. Uh, Netanyahu and his supporters began casting about for another way to quote unquote, win the war. And the way to win this war in their minds strategically is to attack Hezbollah because they know that that's their best shot at widening the war. And Yeah, that's an interesting perspective. All right, Israel's struggling with Hamas. So it would make sense that uh, Bibi Netanyahu would look for a war that he could win. Also, a wider conflagration gives Israel more room to conduct ethnic cleansing of its unwanted Arabs in its midst and also suck the United States into the conflict more deeply. Bringing in the United States on their side, not just against Hezbollah, but also against Iran. And from the very beginning, the obsession with Iran dictated action that would bring Iran to war against Israel. Well, I think Mr. Netanyahu's wishes are being fulfilled right now. He's got an aircraft carrier battle group uh, headed to the Eastern Mediterranean to support him. Uh, I don't know where the Eisenhower is or what its state is, but... So I don't think uh, Colonel Douglas McGregor is some all-seeing prognosticator. He's interesting, right? He does have some useful things to say. He's not a big fan of Jews and the Jewish state. Does not mean that his analysis is useless? It went into port after being damaged in some way by the Houthis, but I suspect that they could refurbish the Eisenhower, bring that back out to sea, which gives two carrier battle groups with uh, the capability to contribute to Mr. Netanyahu's war. So I think right now, the one thing we can bet on very, very certainly with great certainty, is a war with Hezbollah. There's no question about it. And Hezbollah says it's ready. It not only says it's ready, but it says it's going to have additional fighters show up to support them. I think they know uh, that ultimately, when Israel goes after them, it's a war to the finish. There's no question about it. It's even worse than what we've seen, uh, frankly, in Gaza. This is a war that the Israelis know they cannot afford to lose which inevitably means that Iran will come into the war. Now, I don't know if the Israelis will open hostilities against Hezbollah with the use of a quote-unquote tactical nuclear weapon, but I would not rule it out. They know that the, the Hezbollah is heavily dug in, very well prepared, and has a multitude of weapons that they can hurl at Israel. It could level large parts of Haifa as well as uh, Tel Aviv, where most of the Israelis are now concentrated. 
Okay, so I think that idea that Israel's just itching to use a nuclear weapon, I, I, I don't buy that. Would Israel use a nuclear weapon if uh, the, the state was being overrun and, and defeated against its enemy? Sure, but I don't think uh, Israel's looking, hoping for an opportunity to use a nuclear weapon. All right, let's get uh, back to Steve Saylor here. The NBA reached it in Nadir in 2004 when the American Dream Team lost games at the Athens Olympics to Argentina, Lithuania, and Puerto Rico. Daryl Dawkins, Chocolate Thunder on the famously black Philadelphia 76ers team that lost the 1977 NBA Finals to the late Bill Walton's whiter Portland Trailblazers, remarked that year, the black game by itself is too chaotic and much too selfish. So this is how normal people talk all the time who love basketball. They'll, they'll talk about white guy basketball and black guy basketball. White culture places more of a premium on winning, less on self-indulgent preening and chest beating. In basketball and in civilian life, freedom without structure winds up being chaotic and destructive. And so in the fall of 2004, during the notorious malice at the Palace Brawl in suburban Detroit, a massive fight between the Pistons and the Indiana Pacers spilled into the stands. The NBA then decided to insist that their players behave like serious professionals rather than like rap stars who seem to glorify in shooting and getting shot. Some people love to love and be loved. Other people love to shoot and be shot. One change was a dress code banning gang gear. Right. Dress code has a profound effect on you. The more religious the Jew, right, the more care he takes with his dress, right? The more likely as a man he is to wear a black suit and a white shirt. Players responded by mocking the rule by dressing like bourgeois Carlton on the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. But then something unexpected happened. Many of the NBA athletes realized that they liked their new uncool image. After all, to get as far as they had in life, they had to have a touch of Ernest Carlton about them. Yeah, you don't get far in life by only engaging in thuggish behavior and cynicism and preening, right? That's, that's not a good recipe for going far in life. So the idea of asking any particular group in the U.S., whether it's blacks or, or gays or Jews or Christians to do better seems unthinkably racist today. But two day, decades ago in the NBA, it worked. Other rules were changed to advantage more skilled shooters over defensive goons. Referees were encouraged by the NBA Home Office to protect the otherworldly ectomorph Kevin Durant from the beating he no doubt would have endured a decade previously. Right? This year, healthy Durant made the all-NBA second team at age 35. And NBA franchises started following baseball's front office trend by hiring quantitative geniuses out of MIT to Moneyball Basketball. The nerds then kept pointing out that since 1979, the NBA had awarded 50% more points on a shot from beyond 23 feet, 9 inches. So gingerly, teams started trying more three-pointers. Then boyish-looking Stefan Curry introduced a conceptual breakthrough reminiscent of baseball slugger Babe Ruth nearly a century before, just as Ruth became the first hitter to routinely swing for the fences in 1918 to 1920. Steph Curry realized that there was all the room in the world on the basketball court to get off undefended three-pointers if he was willing to back up to 30 feet or farther. So just as Ruth willingly traded off more strikeouts for more home runs, Curry accepted longer shots to get more open ones. Three-point revolution proved so successful, the NBA developed a nice problem. Lisa's viewed from the dreary perspective of 1999. Players got so good at shooting from long distances that scoring reached silly heights during the season just ended, such as in the last NBA All-Star game with its absurd final score of 211 to 186. Commissioner Adam Silver is widely removed, rumored to have then sent a secret directive mid-season to his refs telling them to let the defenders play a little rougher without calling so many fouls against them. Right? Sports leagues adapt to changing conditions. Now, Caitlin Clark became the highest scoring woman player in NCAA history by introducing the Curry era to the women's game. It's the first time I've watched uh, women's basketball. Right? For example, she broke the women's scoring record last February on a 35-footer. Right. At, at what point will... Caitlin Clark's range become normal among women basketball players like home run hitting did after Babe Ruth showed it was possible, or will Clark's records remain outliers like Wilt Chamberlain's 100 points in an NBA game? All right, so Caitlin Clark's scoring success has made her the most popular female college player of all time, and she led the under-talented, mostly white University of Iowa teams to consecutive NCAA final games in front of remarkably numerous TV audiences. Right, women's sports tend to be small but upscale because most women athletes tend to be the product of two-parent homes who have strong relationships with their jockish fathers. The daughters of single moms tend to obsess over how to catch a man 
while the daughters of wealthy dads who stay married to their mums want to please their fathers by excelling at what he is interested in, sports. So as Chris Rock said, as a father, you only have one job to do, keep your daughter off the pole. For example, women pole voters tend to be exceptionally beautiful. They tend to be girls who would normally be cheerleaders. Right? The acrobatic demands are similar, except that their dads make so much money that they can afford sizable pole voting runways in their backyards. The NBA, WNBA, however, is more time. Brings in only 2% as much revenue as the NBA. Rookies like Clark are capped at a salary under 77000 a year. So WNBA has a downscale athletic base that tends to be macho black women who are lesbians and like sport for its own sake, not because they want to please their dads, who they usually have not seen much of. Uh, Caitlin Clark is a typical upper-middle-class white woman athlete with a 6'6 boyfriend of the type that predominated the Winter Olympics. Her father is a corporate executive, as was her mother, before she became a stay-at-home mom because her husband was making enough for the whole family. Not surprisingly, other WNBA players tend to hate Caitlin Clark and try to brutalize her. More surprisingly, NBA executives haven't come to their meal tickets aid. WNBA players tend to have more diversity Pokemon points, being women, black, and lesbian. But sports lately have been gamed by brilliant MIT grads. So the sight of low-brow players being allowed to wreck the WNBA's big chance to finally cash in is uh, particularly curious. Because most of the Israelis have left the South, moved further into the center, and the same thing has happened with Israelis living in the North. They've pulled out and moved further into the center which means these are even more dangerously lucrative targets if Hezbollah responds in an all-out war against the Israelis. And they also know that there's a very high probability that if uh, Hezbollah is in a fight to the finish with the Israelis and Iran comes in, that, Iran, that Russia is not going to allow Iran to be destroyed by us. It will stand by Iran. And then there's something else that's very interesting it's, it strikes me that very few Americans are looking at Cyprus right now. Cyprus is the unsinkable aircraft carrier in the eastern Mediterranean for Israel. The Greeks have made it very clear, the Greeks control half the island, that those bases will be accessible by the Israelis. Well, as soon as that occurs, I think the Turks are suddenly going to say that's unacceptable to them, especially since those bases will be used for strikes against Hezbollah then it seems very probable that the Turks will finally dust off their equipment and decide to enter the war. And that's a, that's a, an incredible development that will not necessarily globalize the war, but it will certainly regionalize it yeah. in a way that we have not seen in the past. And, and as Gary just uh, tossed up there, here, here's almost right on cue is a, is a headline in The Guardian that Hezbollah leader has expressly said Cyprus will be a target if it lets Israel use its territory in a conflict. And, and I wonder if you could explain a little bit more for, for some of our viewers who may not understand the direct tie to Turkey and what they may or may not do as a result. Well, years ago in the 1960s, there was a, an intervention in Cyprus. The Turks actually came in and went to war to protect the Turkish population on Cyprus from the Greeks. And I think this is something that Americans should revisit and look at very carefully. We've had some measure of stability on the island, but it's another one of these uh, open sores. It's similar to the arrangements that we've made in the Balkans. We managed to come up with an arrangement that would temporarily cause parties to cease fire, but we haven't solved anything. And the Cyprus... So Israel looks like it's in the most desperate straits in the, in the last 50 years, since the Yom Kippur War of 1973 problem has never really been solved. And so I think this is an opportunity for the Turks to come in and solve the problem in ways that they wanted to do years ago. They were prevented from it by... So there are a lot of things that people want to do, but given the current incentives, they don't do. But if current situation changes, if current incentive changes, then people are ready to act. Nations are ready to act. We are profoundly affected by the situation, All right? The situation changes and the incentives change, right? Then all sorts of things that people want to do, they will start doing. And you might not like many of them, right? So you may think your neighbor, neighbor Joe is a mild-mannered, you know, kindly guy. But in certain circumstances, he will turn your life upside down, right? Nobody is always kind and good and truthful. And so too with nations, right? There are no permanent alliances. 
or there are a shifting interests. And so if Israel goes to war with Hezbollah and then Turkey takes over Cyprus and then Iran comes to the aid of Hezbollah and then in this maelstrom, the United States intervenes on behalf of Israel and Hezbollah is firing thousands of rockets into Israel, flattening much of Tel Aviv, Jerusalem and Haifa, uh, plunging the country into darkness, right? Just destroying the electrical grid. Desperate times in Israel will lead to desperate measures, and many people high up in the Israeli government would love to take advantage of such a cataclysm to start pushing out the Arabs from the West Bank and Gaza. Yes, and the Turks at that point valued their position in NATO uh, as so much that they wouldn't risk it in an all-out war to seize control of Cyprus. But that goes away if the Israelis move in and start using those bases. At the same time, uh, the European Union promised Turkey that at some point it would enter the European Union, but there was never any real intention to admit the Turks to Europe. And with the mass migration of uh, Muslims out of the Middle East and North Africa. Yeah, shocking. Not everyone means what they say in domestic politics or international politics. And yet, when you follow the news, it tends to take people on a very literal basis. Turkey into Europe, that's even less likely now. So the bottom line is, I think the next step in this war is an all-out war on the part of Israel and Hezbollah against each other. The very high probability that Iran will now move into the conflict to support its friends in southern Lebanon, because I don't think they're going to stand by and allow Israel to destroy them. That brings in Russia, and that also opens the door to Turkey. And I think the Russians will tell the Turks, if you want to move on Cyprus, we'll support you because we understand that's a vital strategic interest for you. You don't want Cyprus to become the aircraft carrier for your enemies. And the Turks are increasingly view, viewing Israel as their enemy. Uh, and okay, but, but so, Doug, this brings up some, some humongous, I mean, I mean uh, there's geostrategic issues that are just off the charts here, and I'm sure that you're probably going to touch on them in a second, but there's some huge prospect. Okay, so to understand Doug McGregor, you have to understand the incentives that he's operating under. So the more attention grabbing his pronouncements, all right, the, the higher his profile. So he doesn't have a conventional position as a mainstream pundit where he has to defend his credibility. So he is strongly incentivized to take you know, shots from long range, right, to carry on with the Caitlin Clark metaphor. And if he hits some of these shots from long range, then he looks like a genius. And if he misses, nobody will really care. Now, yeah, Europe doesn't want a dominantly Muslim nation as, as part of the European Union. But they're not going to come out and say that. Some problems on the tactical and operational level for the United States. We're already into the red in some of our uh, stockpiles of ammunition because we've been given so much to Ukraine. Now we signed a 10-year prospect. To okay, so for all Doug McGregor's problems, at least he's not pious. Right? There's an enormous international humanitarian law world out there where all sorts of people doing all sorts of things that make them feel amazing and excited, but it's a terribly pious and pompous world that doesn't tend to have m much of an effect on, on uh, the real world. And uh, Samuel Moyne, he's a Harvard scholar. He, he wrote a great book about the human rights industrial complex. I think this book came out about uh, 2010. And he notes that uh, people in the human rights complex and, and scholars of human rights and international humanitarian law, right, they, they approach their subject in spite of its novelty. All right, human rights as a universal concern is basically brand new from the 1960s. Right? And historians and scholars of human rights and international humanitarian law, they approach their subject the same way that church historians once approached theirs. Right? They regard the basic cause just as church historians treated the Christian religion as a saving truth, right? A salvific process, right? Discovered rather than made in history. And so the heroes who advance human rights in the world, just like the Christian church's apostles and saints, are treated with uncritical wonderment, hagiography, for the sake of moral imitation of those who chase the flame of international humanitarian law and human rights, it becomes the main genre. 
and the organizations that institutionalize human rights are treated like the early church, a, a fledgling but hopefully universal community of believers struggling for good in a veil of tears. If the cause fails, it is because of evil. If it succeeds, it's not by accident, but because the cause is just. Well, human rights virtually never succeed as a cause, right? So this is a movement that it operates dominantly on myth, which is kind of weird because when you're trying to make the case for a movement that is new, that is highly contingent, meaning it has no power, and, and whatever influence and whatever possible power it might have is highly contingent on various nation states deciding to use the human rights crusade for their own purposes. Do you know anyone who's big in human rights who comes from a right-wing background? Do you know anyone who's big in international humanitarian law who comes from a right-wing background? They overwhelmingly come from backgrounds in feminism, uh, Marxism, communism, Leninism, anti-colonialism, right, leftism. Right? They are people who become disappointed with left-wing utopian politics such as Marxism and communism, and they're seeking another utopian crusade, and it doesn't really matter to them if it makes absolutely no difference in the real world. And the way they talk about human rights is the same way that uh, a rabbi will give a sermon in an Orthodox synagogue where you just take it for granted that uh, people are going to accept that the Torah came from God. And so when you say the Torah says, right, e even if you're referring to some pronouncement of a rabbi 400 or 800 or 1200 years ago, or the five books of the, the Pentateuch, right, it's still attributable to God. And because this is the setting, right? You get up and you give a sermon in an Orthodox synagogue, and there's a particular pious setting where you attribute things to Torah and to God, and you talk about the, the great you know, rabbis of the past and, and the brave uh, parishioners of, of the past, uh, the ordinary Jews who stood up for Torah, and, and there's just a certain, certain piety, and there's a certain inspiration level, and so we all need to do better and and work together and do one more mitzvah so that we can bring them a shiach and hasten the ultimate redemption. All right, but you see that same piety in the world of, of international human humanitarian law and, and human rights, which is weird because these fields are so brand new, they have no real-world power aside from the possibility of self-aggrandizement. And they are so profoundly shaped by contingency, by culture, by whatever narratives are going on at the time, that you would think that if they wanted to take their cause seriously, that they would be very careful in their pronouncements. Because a single overstatement has the power to ruin for the reader or the listener any possible credibility. But the international humanitarian uh, lawyers and the, the human rights lawyers aren't really interested in making converts among those who think critically, right? They are only speaking to the already converted. And so they take absolutely no care with the accuracy and, 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 and the clarity and describing the contingency and the contestation of, of their field and its, and its highly limited uh, real-world applicability, which is which is stunning, right? Because unless you, you buy into this utopia, right, the, the, the human rights talk, if you know anything about human rights and international humanitarian law, it seems absurd. So I'll give you an example from the, the real world. So let's say you have a client who has intellectual property and he wants to sell the intellectual property, right? And you're the attorney negotiating on behalf of the seller of intellectual property. The buyer may well demand some indemnification clauses so that if it turns out your intellectual property is stolen, that the, the buyer is off the hook for, for the consequences of you stealing intellectual property and then claiming it as your own. So from the seller's perspective and from the seller's legal counsel's perspective, they want to make the indemnification clauses as broad as possible, right? So in legal world, indemnification clauses are known as the nuclear bombs of clauses, right? Indemnification, one single indemnification, indemnification clause can ruin your whole day. 
And, and what type of personality succeeds usually as a lawyer? Someone who can keep track of where a clause on page 17 right, means something different on page 291. Right? Is that, that precise analytical ability is what makes for a good lawyer. And so the buyer wants to maximize the range of protection that he will get in an indemnification clause. Right? The indemnification clause says uh, if this intellectual property turns out to be stolen and the buyer then gets sued, right, the, the seller has to cover uh, up to 50% of the sales price, 100% of the sales price. Right? So from a, a buyer's perspective, you want to make those indemnification clauses big, broad, roomy, and to have the, the power of, of nuclear bombs, right? One indemnification clause will destroy you. One indemnification clause can negate an entire life of successful entrepreneurship. Let's say that you've worked on something uh, your entire life, and then you're getting old, and, and you're ready to sell, and there's an intellectual property component to what you're selling, and you have steadily, honestly worked hard. You have accumulated a property that, that has a sales price of $50 million. But if you sign off on a careless indemnification clause, right, you'll lose all of that $50 million and, and even be, be liable for more. You can be reduced to absolute poverty and, and bankruptcy if your attorney is not careful with the way he negotiates an indemnification clause. Right? From the buyer's perspective, he wants to make the indemnification clause as narrow as possible, as limited as possible, as specific as possible, as nailed down as possible, right? You don't want your indemnification clause being all airy-fairy. You want no wiggle room in your indemnification clauses if you are an attorney representing the seller. And so too, if you are trying to establish something brand new like human rights as, as a global concern where you have no real power in the world. So the only power you have essentially is your credibility. If you're trying to develop international humanitarian law that has virtually no power in the world, but you're trying to persuade people of its virtues, right? when you're trying to make the case for something that has no real world power and seemingly no ability to punish its opponents, then your credibility is everything. And so you want to make your claims as specific as possible, as literal as possible. If your claim is contingent, you want to describe those contingencies just as if you are an attorney negotiating for a seller dealing with the buyer's insistence on indemnification clauses. Right? If you want to have any credibility, right, you want to be as accurate as possible, as specific as possible, give the context as much as possible, to allow as little airy, fairy, uh, gauzy, pious uh, rumination, just uh, you don't want to allow space for your claims to expand like, uh, like a gas in, in the air. Because then anyone who's a, a critical thinker will fail to accord you any credibility. And the only people who will join your cause are those people who don't care about what is true. And don't care about what is accurate and don't care about understanding things in their time and place and don't care about understanding the, the contingency that is shaping your claims. Now, let's say that you are an attorney for a seller and let's say that uh, you're, you're just a mediocre attorney who has no background in intellectual property. Should you then be negotiating indemnification clauses with a top international property law firm like Skadden Arps, right? Skadden Arps has got about 800 to 1,000 top-notch, the very best intellectual property attorneys, right? But you, you, you're a personal injury attorney, and, and do you really want to go up against Skadden Arps on your own negotiating indemnification clauses? No, you don't. So if you're in a brand new field of human rights and international humanitarian law, and you're coming from a tradition, you're trying to build upon a tradition of carefully drawn narratives and concepts with regard to laws of war, right? If you want to retain any credibility, right? You want to have a fealty to the facts and you don't want to overstate your points, right? You're in a whole brand new arena and 
you probably don't know very much. And so when you don't know very much, you want to be particularly careful. And when you're overmatched, then you need to recognize that and get help. Otherwise, you're going to get sued for legal malpractice. Or if you're a partisan uh, promoter of human rights or international humanitarian law, you'll just have no credibility. And so credibility is everything when you don't have any this worldly power. And international humanitarian law and human rights has virtually no this worldly power. It, it's just like the Christians during the first 300 years, right, when they, they were living in catacombs and they were hunted down and they were persecuted. And so in the real world, right, the, the countries that have nuclear weapons of formidable armies, right, they are not exactly shaking in their boots at the prospect of uh, Human Rights Watch releasing some uh, critique of them. So you have to know your limits, mate. And an example of someone who doesn't know his limits is Arie Nair, writing in the New York Review of Books, the June 6, 2024 issue. Is Israel committing genocide? I have been engaged for six decades in the human rights movement. So there's something about men as they get older, particularly as they pass age 40. They want more and more honor, right? They want more and more applause. They expect more and more gratitude, right? They expect more and more deference. It's just part of being a man. So just like young men are scrapping to build their kingdom 25 to 40, as men move through their 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, they want more and more deference. They want to be treated like the kings that they are if indeed they have built something. And if you don't accord someone who has a, an impressive track record that, that deference, then they're not going to be very happy with you and they're not going to cooperate with you. So this guy, right, he's saying, give me deference, right? He's been engaged in this utopian human rights movement uh, for six decades, right? But listen to the utopian things that he's saying here. I have been engaged for six decades in the human rights movement, which has endeavored to restore peace by enforcing international humanitarian law. So on a scale of zero to 100, how successful has the human rights and international humanitarian law crusade been? It's been a zero out of 100. Right? They've been endeavoring for six decades to restore peace, and they've done nothing. Right? They've done nothing to restore peace when nation states and terrorist organizations have incentives to commit war. So can the law bring a measure of justice to the victims of Israel's and Hamas's violence? Yes, law can bring a measure of justice to the victims of Israel and Hamas's violence. If that law is backed up by formidable armies, <laughs> the, the, the equivalent, right, the military equivalent of an indemnification clause, right? You've got an army that's as powerful as an explosive indemnification clause, all right? You can you can blow up some people, but you can endeavor with your international humanitarian law and human rights to make a difference in the real world, and it's just not going to do anything because if a nation sees that it is better off going to war and prosecuting a war or terrorist organizations see that they're better off prosecuting a war. They're just going to keep doing that. But in the final analysis, Ari Nier, those in the international humanitarian law racket and in the human rights racket, they're not in it to make a difference in the real world. They're in it to feel amazing, to get the feel. So remember COVID, but I don't know if you have a wife or a sister, or, or a mother, or a girlfriend. Women loved COVID because health is one of the few areas where women consistently know more than men. And women loved the drama of COVID, right? They loved the sturm und drang, the emotional turmoil, all right? Women, women were so happy, so enthused, at least initially during COVID. I mean, this was their time. This was their time to shine. They were going to set the standards Right, they, they're a lot like the international humanitarian law and, and human rights racket, just filled with excitement, filled with utopian schemes, filled with drama. Right, these guys are going to bring peace to the world, and these guys are going to pursue justice for the victims. Right, could, could you get any more exciting and, and dramatic a crusade than uh, pursuing peace and justice? So let me just tell you a little bit about this guy, 
Ariete Nier. Today, the human rights movement includes thousands of organizations around the world. That's true. Right? There are thousands of organizations around the world that are interested in astrology, right? Because it provides drama and purpose and meaning to people's lives, just like human rights. Right? Among international citizen movements, only the environmental movement might be better developed. Yeah, better developed in terms of funding, in terms of numbers, in terms of access to the media, but nearly zero developed in terms of real-world effects. Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, neither of which seeks or accepts government funding. Oh my God, how lofty they are not to seek or accept government funding. Well, no 12-step program usually will take a donation over $2,000 and won't take any money from you if you're not a member of that 12-step program. But uh, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch have offices and hundreds of research staff members in many countries. Yeah, they've got a good racket going. Right? So what would happen if Human Rights Watch you know, went up against Putin's army? Right? It'd be like the Dallas Cowboys playing football against Yeshiva University. Amnesty staff is much larger. larger. So we're talking thousands upon thousands of employees engaged in a utopian endeavor. Over the past few decades, these organizations have created a broad awareness that there is a body of law known as international humanitarian law. So notice the dishonest way that he wants to frame this, that human rights and international humanitarian law, uh, they've been there all along, but we just needed people to bring awareness to, to these things. International humanitarian law it represents civilized values and regulates the conduct of combatants. And it comes from communism, comes from Marxism, Right? I don't know any significant right-wing thinkers who have made significant contributions and are highly esteemed in the world of international humanitarian law. How many human rights activists come from a right-wing background and still consider themselves right-wing? Right? I don't know any. Right? This is overwhelmingly a Marxist, communist, feminist, Leninist, anti-colonial, utopian, another left-wing utopian cause. International humanitarian law forbids such practices as indiscriminate bombing. Wow, you know, I too forbid such practices as indiscriminate bombing. But somehow, even though I'm 58 years of age, nobody has listened to me. But as many people have listened to me and my forbidding of indiscriminate bombing, as people have listened to international humanitarian lawyers and Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, right? Uh, these organizations require militaries to protect civilians from harm. Well, I too require militaries to protect civilians from harm. I let Vladimir Putin know right away when he invaded Ukraine that he had to protect civilians from harm. And I had as much effect on Vladimir Putin as thousands of human rights activists. Do you realize that? The man who stands before you right now, I have the equal effect on Hamas, on Vladimir Putin, on uh, China's genocide in Tibet, on uh, the, what, all the, the genocides of the past 50 years, Rwanda, right? I have as much effect on these world events in curbing human cruelty as 10,000 brilliant lawyers in international humanitarian law and human rights law and thousands of researchers and activists, right? I have the equivalent effect. I have the equivalent real-world power of, of 20,000 well-funded, highly esteemed highly educated, high IQ people, part of cohesive organizations, and me, just 40 here, just a bloke, just a 58-year-old bloke, you know, screaming into the void. I have as much effect as the entire human rights and international humanitarian law industrial complex. Me, just little old me, just a simple Jew, just a bloke from Kurumbang, just sharing my thoughts. I have as much effect on Vladimir Putin and those organizations and individuals that carry out genocide. I have had equal amount of effect on these people as Arie Niyir and 20,000 human rights international humanitarian lawyers. But I, I don't want credit. I mean, I don't need your, your super chats, right? Uh, you don't need to offer your body to me. Right? I, I'm just a simple Jew. All I want is lead a simple life following God's commandments. So here's Ariate Nier. Some principles of international humanitarian law have ancient roots. Right. Such 
measly, such dishonest wording. All right. Yeah, literally true. But he's trying to tie in international humanitarian law to any laws of war down through history. But international humanitarian law is its own thing. It's its own development. And you got to read the work of Amanda Alexander at Australian Catholic University in, in Australia. She, she's just done some amazing scholarship on, on these things T- to just be accurate, to note the feminist influence on this, the anti-colonial influence on this, the uh, Leninist influence on this, the communist influence on this, how the narratives keep changing, how the claims are made frequently without much regard for facts. And I'm rereading her terrific essay on short history of humanitarian law. So it really took off in the late 1990s. The international legal community became focused on ethnic conflicts in Yugoslavia and Rwanda and the attempts of the newly functional UN Security Council to respond to these events. Yay, the United States, along with NATO, they crushed Serbia. Wasn't that magnificent? Just crushed Serbia. And they went and fought on behalf of Muslims. And Muslims were so grateful. Right? They, they forswore uh, partaking in any violence against the United States because they were so grateful for all the efforts that the United States and Europe took on behalf of vulnerable Muslims in the Balkans in the late 1990s. And, and we just forever developed Muslim goodwill. And so you had these ad hoc tribunals for Rwanda and Yugoslavia conflicts, and you had work towards an international criminal court. Now, human rights and international humanitarian law, it can bite, but only when nation states that have formidable armies and formidable economies funding formidable armed forces decide to use human rights, to use international humanitarian law for their own purposes. So just like women... You know, we'll often see a guy and, and think, oh, this is a guy who's going to protect and provide for me, and they'll see him for his wallet, and they'll, uh, they'll, they'll be excited, and they'll try to attach to someone who will protect and provide for her. And men will sometimes look at women, and they'll just see an opportunity for sex, and they forget her full humanity. Right? So, too, nations that want to use international humanitarian law or human rights right, to further their own purposes, right, they may not follow in the true spirit of human rights. They may not under the gestalt, understand the gestalt of international humanitarian law. Right? We all tend to use, right? Employees tend to use employers to get as much money as possible by doing as little work as possible. Employers tend to use employees by extracting as much work from them as possible while paying them as little money as possible. Right? Guess what? People who want a job often lie during a job interview, and guess what? People who are seeking to hire someone during a job interview often don't tell the prospective employee uh, the full score, right? So uh, men who are dating women, women dating men are often trying to deceive each other and use each other to just get their needs met, right? So we finally had an institutional environment to enforce international humanitarian law because we had some nation states with formidable armies willing to go to bat for this new concept of international humanitarian law, right? Such as the United States and NATO countries and various states in Africa who are opposed to what was going on with the genocide in in Rwanda. So for the first time, it appeared that international humanitarian law was no longer just a pseudo code. So when is international humanitarian law a pseudo code? And when is international humanitarian law no longer a pseudo code? It's no longer a pseudocode when there are nations with highly effective armed forces willing to back up and enforce international humanitarian law. Law is only as strong as the armed forces that are prepared to enforce it. Right? A law that is not enforced is not a practical law. Human rights that are not enforced by a formidable armed forces are just a utopian scheme. Right? They're just a dream. Right? A an explosive indemnification clause that is not litigated, that is not enforced, that is not referenced, right, has no power, right? Let's say you make a deal, you're the buyer, you, you've got uh, these wonderful indemnification clauses in the contract with, with the seller, 
but then you lose the contract and your attorneys lose the contract. You have no access to, to the contract and uh, you miss statute of limitations. Well, you still got an indemnification clause on the books, right? You have beautiful writings about human rights on the books, right? If you've been screwed over in business, if someone tripped you and broke your back and inflicted permanent lifelong damages on you that would be worth in a normal legal proceeding of, of a good solid personal injury attorney in Southern California, you'd be, you'd be set for, for making a million dollar verdict, right? Means nothing if you miss the statute of limitations. Means nothing if your attorney is incompetent, right? You're gonna get much less money if your jury is in the San Fernando Valley as opposed to being in downtown Los Angeles, right? A, a blacker jury will give you more money than a whiter jury. So law isn't just what's on the books, right? The meaning of law is who enforces it and how rigorously do they enforce it and who exactly enforces international humanitarian law. Only certain nation states at certain times and places under certain contingent conditions when they see it as being in the, the best interests of their state and whatever coalition they, they want to create. So just having laws on the books doesn't mean a whole heck of a lot, right? The Bible says all sorts of things that religious people don't follow. I converted to Orthodox Judaism, got a secret to share with you. Most Orthodox Jews do not perfectly observe Orthodox Jewish law. Most religious people do not perfectly observe their religion, right? People pick and choose overwhelmingly. And all the laws on the books in a religion, right, it's not going to coerce behavior if there's no communal sanction. Right? If there is a communal sanction to violating Torah law publicly, then to belong to that community, you will have to avoid deliberately, provocatively violating law that your community holds sacred if you want to stay in the good graces of your community. Otherwise, you're very likely to be exiled. All right, if you go to young Israel Century City, and you, uh, you drive on the Sabbath, right? it's very likely that a rabbi will pull you aside and say you should not do that. And if you persist in doing it, you're very likely to be shown the door. Right? Depending on the context. If you're someone who's not pretending to be observant, that's a different cat category. But if you're someone who, who does pretend to be observant, and then you're editing porn movies, right? and, and that, that knowledge gets out, or you're engaged, engaged in... You know, very shady businesses practices, right? Many modern Orthodox synagogues will kick you out. So humanitarian law, when you have an army to enforce it, is no longer a pseudocode. Now, pseudocode or real code, international humanitarian law became a real option for study, research, and work. It was exciting, right? COVID was exciting, particularly for many women, particularly in the beginning, because this was an area where they knew more than men. They were more interested in men, and it was... It just stirred up all sorts of dramatic emotions in, in women that uh, men were largely immune to, just as sports tends to evoke intense emotions in men that women are typically immune to. Uh, men love to fight. Men love to compete. Men love to go to war. Right? Men uh, start competing at a very early age when, when men... When uh, men are boys and they're designing games to compete with other boys, right? They always design rules. So men are used to competition with rules, which is how the laws of war used to operate. Then human rights and international humanitarian law came along as a much more feminist, nurturing endeavor. And uh, women do not like competition by and large. They do not like having whole sets of laws to abide by, right? They prefer a more democratic, uh, kind of egalitarian, uh, let's figure things out together sense, right? Men respect hierarchy, right? Women tend not to like hierarchy, right? Men respect law, men respect rules, men respect protocols, men respect hierarchy, men respect the laws of war and the laws of competition. These are all natural masculine impulses because men are just naturally much more physically aggressive than women. Men have at least 10 times the murder rate of women. Right? If, if I told you that uh, I got uh, beat up the other day, right, the odds are 98% you know, that the person who beat me up was, was a man. Right? There are not many women 
who could beat me up. I, I've never dated a woman who was physically stronger than me. Uh, and in all likelihood, you have never dated a woman who is physically stronger than you. So men are more competitive, more physically aggressive. And what keeps this in check is that they also they respond to hierarchy and to, to rules and to laws. Uh, women don't like competition. When they're thrust into competition, they react badly, and they don't tend to observe many rules regarding a competition. So that's why women will often fight in a much more dirty way, such as after a divorce or after a breakup of a relationship. So let me tell you, uh, two people were together, and after three months, right, one of them decided to call it quits. Right? If I told you that one party then went out a jihad to ruin the life of the person who no longer wanted to date that person, right? would you be shocked if it was a woman? Right? I have had women just try to ruin my life simply because I no longer wanted to date them. I have male friends who've had women do everything they could to ruin their life simply because the guy did not want to date them. I know it happens, but it's much rarer that a man who gets dumped by a woman then dedicates himself to ruining her life because almost all men would regard such a man as unmanly. Part of being a man is providing and protecting for a spouse and a family and a certain stoicism, right? That you would fall apart and engage in such petty dramatics, right? Would, would strike most men as unmanly, you know, weak womanly behavior. So it's not that men are superior or women are superior, right? D different sexes have, have different gifts. Right? Men resp respect rules regarding competition. Women tend to hate competition and tend to you know, fight dirty often in battles with men that, that men would never consider. So humanitarian law and human rights becomes overwhelmingly much more feminine, Marxist, Leninist, communist, uh, left-wing utopian scheme. And name me, name me the major right-wingers who are still right-wing who are major forces in either human rights or international humanitarian law. I'm unaware of any, right? Laws of war. Virtually all the leading scholars and proponents and practitioners of the laws of war were men. But international human humanitarian law is a much more womanly endeavor. It's exciting, it's dramatic, like the beginning of COVID. It, it responds more to, to the person, male or female, who's interested in nurturing. I grew up a Seventh-day Adventist. Seventh-day Adventists are incredibly nurturing. The church is also 70% women. So the third of the church that is men, they have still taken up many of these womanly nurturing outlooks and practices in life. Seventh-day Adventism is one of those rare Western religions that was substantially founded by a woman, Ellen G. White. So human rights, international humanitarian law is an exciting, dramatic, emotional, feminine communist, Marxist, Leninist pursuit. And so you have a new cohort of academics entering international law and start producing a large body of literature. So what are the dynamics when you have a female-dominated department or a female-dominated uh, business or, or group or club? Right? It tends to act in an ostensibly democratic, egalitarian fashion, but it tends to be highly clicky, right? the organization ceases to be so much about obeying certain rules and observing a hierarchy, which is much more of a male tendency. Instead, it's about uh, fitting in with the cool girls and staying you know, on good terms with everyone. And if you're a man and you want to put a negative spin on this, you, you'd, you'd call these female-dominated departments covens, right? That, that's a male put-down. But they have a different organizational structure and they operate differently than male-dominated arenas. So think about the difference between uh, departments of education and departments of economics, right? Economics is one of the last bastions of masculinity in the social sciences. So you've got a large body of literature coming out of an increasingly feminist and Marxist-dominated arena. And it's completely different to the skeptical and pessimistic and masculine work of the early 1990s, which was dominated by male military lawyers and a male military perspective. Right? Name me the greatest female generals in history. There, there have been some, but for every one great female general, there, there have been at least 10 or 20 or 50 great male generals. If you were to list 
the 50 greatest male generals, the 50 greatest generals in history, not one would be a woman. If you were to list the 1,000 greatest Talmudic scholars in history, not one would be a woman. If you were to name the top 100 Talmud scholars right now, not one would be a woman. If you were to name the top 50 scholars of the laws of war, I don't think one would be a woman. Right? If, if one was, all right, you'd have one or two out of 50. All right. If, if you were to name the top 100 military strategists in history, all 100 would be men. I said military strategy, military lawyers, and the laws of war. This was a very masculine perspective that was skeptical, right, and pessimistic about the ability of the laws of war and international humanitarian law to protect civilians against the depredations of militaries who are bent primarily on achieving certain objectives, right? It was taken for granted until the 1990s that essentially militaries would pursue their objectives and the most that could be hoped for was that in the pursuit of their objectives, they did not gratuitously uh, attack civilians, right? That, that was the very best you could hope for. To allegedly let that turn into basically a forever war. And Israel's already yelling at us. I mean, that's what Netanyahu was doing because we haven't given enough weapons here on the Hamas. Now, if they open up into Hezbollah, you're talking about a sustained combat that's going to take a lot more rockets, interceptors, artillery, uh, all kinds of other ammunitions, which we don't have. And if you, now then you spread that out over a two-front war while we're doing Ukraine, Doug, we don't have enough for that. Well, we, we've not even addressed the vulnerabilities of the, our forces that are still sitting in the Middle East and the various bases there, which are easy for the Iranians to target. The Iranians have always exercised restraint when they saw that they were walking up to the edge. And we would, we would do the same thing. We always walked up to the edge, but then we said no, because it's really not in the interest of the United States to be at war with Iran. Today, the problem for us is it's not just Iran, it's virtually the whole region that's turning against us. We have no interest that would bring us into war with the Muslim Arabs on the peninsula, as well as Iran, or for that matter, the Turks. Uh, we have no interest whatsoever in that. We have an interest in finding a way to stop this. But here's, here's an important point to keep in mind, and I have to quote John Mearsheimer, who said it very, very well. If our interests and Israel's interests were actually aligned, there would be no requirement or need for a, an Israel lobby. Why is there an Israel lobby pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into people's campaigns and pockets in the hill, on the Hill, in the House, in the Senate, and even in the White House? Because the interests do not align. So they have to be artificially constructed. And that's an artificial construct right now. And I think once the American people discover what's going on, and they'll probably discover after we begin to take losses at sea, there's going to be hell to pay in Washington. No amount of money will ultimately buy off the American electorate. The American electorate is not going to be pleased if we take heavy casualties. And I think that's a real possibility. And again, I go back to Russia doesn't have to engage directly. They can support Iran and they can also support the Turks. And the Turks are going to be very unhappy about these developments on Cyprus. The Turks are already watching carefully to their uh, eastern border where the Israelis have been hard at work as well as we in inspiring the Kurds to attack Turkey. Why would they do that? Because that's a distraction that diverts. So I'm very sensitive to accusations that I'm uh, using the works of various academics for my own purposes. I, 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 just, I just want to share this with you. I am a humble servant of the truth. Right. I only go where the truth leads me. Right. I don't pile any agenda on top of the truth. Right. I don't even know the meaning of the word aggrandizement. Right. I don't even understand terms like egotistical, uh, attention seeker, narcissist, self aggrandizement. Right. I am just a humble servant of the truth. Right. The truth speaks to me. I don't know why the truth chose me as its vessel. I was just living my life. I was happy. I was banging babes. I was getting jiggy. I was getting social. All right. I was out there. All right. I was making things happen. I was doing the all in out. All right. I was just 
living life and loving life and just having a good old time. And then the truth called to me and it said, 40, I need you to investigate the porn industry. And I said, truth, no, it's, it's too dirty. It's, it's too disgusting. I, I've got something great going. I'm new to Los Angeles. I'm just, just absolutely going to town, having, having wonderful, wonderful social interactions, exploring, you know, other Jewish women as we get to know each other Jewishly and learning Torah, learning love. I don't want anything to do with the pornography industry. But the truth said, 40, you must go forth and write a book on the history of the pornography industry. And then you must write a daily column on the internet about the pornography industry for 10 years, right? You must serve me for 10 years and then I will release you. And completely against my own inclinations, right? Completely against anything that was amenable to me. I was willing to take the obloquy of that obligation to the truth, right? I, I was willing to just go where the truth sends me to, to drop all other egotistical concerns to drop all concerns for, for my own reputation, for my own social standing, for my own well-being. But I just went where truth set me. And then 2008, I pick, I pick up a book on the Alexander Technique. And I just followed that to become a trained teacher. Three years of training to become a teacher of the Alexander Technique. Uh, back in 1989, I heard the call of the Torah. Right, I heard the clarion call of the Torah. Truth was talking to me. It said, 40, we need you to study Torah. We need you to practice Torah. We need you to convert to Orthodox Judaism. And I just followed the truth into Orthodox Judaism. And then, what, 1997, the truth said, I need you to start blogging. Books, books aren't, don't cut it anymore. It's a whole new world. Truth said, start, start blogging. And I started blogging. And then started vlogging. All right, and, and now I'm just following the truth into international humanitarian law, human rights. I'm not using the truth, right? I'm not using these concepts. I'm not using the news, right? This is me, the servant, right? I found my calling as the servant, and it's so much easier. There's just less drama. There's less self-loathing. I, I don't wake up at, at 2 a.m. concerned if I'm doing the right thing. Uh, that's really rare now. It used to happen all the time. But because I'm just a humble, unaffected, unpretentious servant of the truth, all right, I'm not using any of these concepts and academic studies and ideas and, and breaking news that I'm sharing with you. I am, I am allowing, I'm allowing them to just flow through me in a pure, undiluted fashion. All right? I'm not someone who comes into a 12-step program and goes, okay, I'm going to use this 12-step program to get what I want. No, I make myself a vessel for the Almighty, for God, for truth to, to flow through me and, and then to serve you the, the, the pure, undiluted truth, right, without any need for partisan agenda. I, I'm just staying in my lane, and my lane is truth. And here, here I am. I can do no other, so help me God. Here I stand. I can do no other. So help me God. I must follow the truth. Okay. So international humanitarian law and human rights, right, becomes a big institutional thing, becomes a huge academic racket starting in the late 1990s, deeply concerned with the victims of warfare and the crimes committed against them, but not so concerned that they need their work and their theorizing to make any difference in the real world. Right, so if I was embarked on some do-gooder scheme, for me to sleep at night, I would need to see evidence that my scheme and my theorizing was making a difference. Right? When I go down the street, sometimes I run into people who go, oh, 40, you know, I was listening to your show, and because I heard your show, I thought maybe I should get checked out for ADHD. Maybe I should uh, try a 12-step program for marijuana addiction. Uh, maybe I should go to AA. Maybe I should look for a good therapist. Maybe I should call my parents who I haven't spoken to for two years. Like when people tell me that they, they've checked out my show, often they'll, they'll describe something morally upstanding and positive and, and beneficial to them that has come from the show because I'm just you know, allowing myself to, to follow the truth wherever it leads. Now, the people who are obsessed with human rights, international humanitarian law, right, they don't need any real world effects, right? They just need to feel something dramatic. And so the victims of landmines, right, just heartbreaking. 
right? So international lawyers would discuss these issues and they would employ this new Marxist, humanitarian, feminist, nurturing vocabulary. And they became more open to human rights values in a way that their predecessors in the laws of war were not. So they believed that international law could reflect these humane, feminist, nurturing, Leninist values, right? They wrote about creating a kinder, meaning more feminine, more victim-focused form of law, a more feminine form of law, right? Men naturally orient upwards, right? Women right, are much more nurturing and willing to look after people below them in social status, such as infants and children. And so this is, this is beautiful on, on parts of both sexes. For men, it inspires them towards excellence. And for women, it inspires them towards nurturing. And yes, some men have nurturing tendencies and they will look after people below them in status. But generally speaking, the male obsession is to focus on people who are above them in status. Men want to keep moving up in status. They really want to look 